Mike, what are you doing up here? I don't know. I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> hey folks, Little John speaking. You're watching Guitar Magic, the van life travel show about the guitar and its people. Today we're headed up the mountain to talk with Mike Baguetta. Mike's a really special player who's worked with David Torn, Nels Klein, Mike Watt, and a ton of other hip cats. A quick thanks to our automotive angels, Go Westy and Top Shop Automotive. If you believe in guitar magic, please subscribe, feed the tip jar, or visit the merch store. Thanks for coming on Guitar Magic. Thanks for having me. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions that uh, hopefully people other than guitar nerds will like. But guitar nerds, if you're out there, this is for you too. How often do you think or daydream about the guitar? I don't know. Probably a lot. I mean, I definitely think about, I think about it a lot in a number of different ways because it's just sort of part of who I am, for better or worse, that I have to think about it. Um, I think a lot of what I try to do ideally exists without the guitar and without the instrument, but it is a conduit for what I want to do, so I do have to think about it. Daydream? I don't know, probably not so much, but I do have to think about mechanics and technical things for sure. Why do you think people fall in love with guitar? Yeah, I think people fall in love with guitar just because it's always, it seems like it's always been around in some form or another in civilization, you know, whether it's been, whether it's been a banjo or a lute or something historical ancestor like that, it's sort of just always been a part of humanity, I think, and it's really familiar too, and I think, you know, humans kind of like the familiar, uh, for better or worse. Um, so I know for me, I fell in love with the guitar because my dad plays it. So even when I was really little, some of my earliest memories are of my dad playing guitar and hearing him make music with it. And I, you know, at, the, at a young age, I didn't know what was going on. I just heard all these incredible sounds coming out of the guitar. And so I think I associated the guitar as this thing with my dad and you know, my parents are great and I love my parents, so it just was this happy <laughs> circular thing like, oh yeah, the guitar is like part of my family and part of my life. So for me, it seemed like a pretty natural thing to get into in that way. Um, but everybody's got a different story, you know, which is why it's so cool to, to hear about all the differences from everyone. But I think people fall in love with guitar because it's just familiar, especially in our culture, uh, and it's just been around forever. and. And it kind of it seems deceptively easy to, to do, too, I think. You know, you see the guitar, it's got the neck, it's got the strings, and you have some idea of how it works, and people start to try to want to play it. And you can get a lot done with a little bit of knowledge on the guitar, but it's also really a very deep thing to kind of study. So I think it can take you as far as you want to go, too, without any kind of judgment. Like, you don't have to go deep into the guitar to get a lot out of it. And I think that's a really cool thing about it also. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of surface level stuff which is really satisfying like in your hands and oh, to your yeah. ears without, without going, like without totally throwing your life away. <laughs> yeah, well, there are a few things I think more enjoyable than playing and hearing an open E major chord on a guitar, for sure. I mean, even to this day, That's still a great sound <laughs> yeah. to me to pick up and just... Whatever you want to go from there, you know. It's a great place to start. Yeah. I was talking with my old man two nights ago, and every year I do a Christmas tune. And I said, I think I'm going to do it in E. And you know, all the jazz was like, why not F or B flat? And he said, yeah, well, E makes sense, because like... The guitar does that really well. It's right there. It's ready to go. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell me about one of your magic moments with the guitar where you just, something happened and you realized, oh shit, this is, this is something. Yeah, actually I can remember the first one, which again kind of goes back to hearing my dad play and watching him play. Um, he had, he had sort of like a wedding band, pop band kind of thing. And so he would be 
he would be out doing two or three shows a weekend. I remember when I was young, and you know he would come home late at night. I'd already be asleep, and I'd wake up in the morning, and like the amp would be in the kitchen. It was one of those big Roland JC 120s, and um, his Les Paul was in the case, and it and it kind of smelled. You know, it definitely. This is we're talking the 1980s, so everything sort of stank like cigarettes because everybody was smoking inside still. I think in those days. And I was little. I didn't know what it was. To me, it was like the smell of a guitar amp <laughs> at a guitar case, you know. Um, and uh, so I would come out and I kind of see the stuff. And I remember he would, he would be up, and I would kind of bug him to play something. And uh, I remember he would plug the guitar into the amp, and he would sit on the amp, and he would play. Yeah, I don't even remember what he would play really, but he would play something, you know, like. It's a spooky sound, a scary chord, you know, or then he'd, then he'd play something like, you know. And just tell him, you know, there's a happy sound. And I was so little, I was like, yeah, that's right, that's amazing. This guy just made, made me feel sad with the sound and then made me feel happy with the sound with this instrument. And I was like blown away thinking like how in the world is this possible <laughs> you know and so definitely that's something that's that stayed with me throughout um, and the idea of you know doing really a lot of instrumental music um, at this point in my career thinking about how do you convey emotions through what you play you know as heavy as you want to get into that kind of stuff for me it always just directly goes back to that moment in our kitchen of me being seven or eight and going like oh yeah it sounds I'm frightened hearing E minor, <laughs> you know. Um, it's a real direct link for me. Yeah, do you, do you use emotion as sort of a, a target with, with what you're doing? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, by the way, for anyone out there who's listening or watching, nothing's out of bounds for you in terms of sound. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, for sure. No, I'll do whatever it takes um, to get the thing that I want to get. Um, and there's a there's a deep history there on, on the guitar of that kind of stuff too. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I'm writing an instrumental piece or, or playing or interpreting someone else's instrumental piece, definitely there's a thought of an emotional target, maybe for lack of a better word, but it's, but a lot of times it is very vague too. Like, I don't always say like, okay, now I'm going for a yearning feeling. <laughs> But there is that sort of feel of an emotion that we have cataloged in our, I think, in our bodies from just living the human experience. Like we've, we've had heartbreak, we've had like overwhelming joy, overwhelming sorrow, um, anxiety, you know, pure bliss, gratitude. Like there's all these things and little different levels and gradations of those feelings that we don't really have names for but you kind of know it when you feel it and it sits in that little catalog of emotional range. So a lot of time when I'm playing or trying to think of how I want to write a tune, that is a large element of what I'm trying to capture. And I feel like if I can get close to capturing some of the essence of that feeling in sound or giving it back to myself when I play something, I feel like that's a sign that it probably might do something similar for other people when they hear it is my hope just about guitars in general is there any particular guitar that you have a connection with yeah um, I mean, maybe a few of them but is there yeah. one in your mind that... <laughs> all of them yeah. um, actually all the ones that I have I feel like I have for a reason and it's not really even like a sound reason it's not like oh I get my Strat sounds and I get my telly sounds or whatever not not meaning like that but everything I have has kind of like come into my life for a reason and I try to hold on to them um, so I would say all of them but if I had to just pick a, a couple <laughs> and I don't have a ton of guitars you know um, I know there's people out there that have like 20 guitars and way more um, I have like seven eight if you count a lap steel which I do um, so I don't I don't think I have like a lot but um, the stuff I have I feel like it's come to me so I have this guitar here is the one I'm traveling with on this trip which is a 
new um, tornado made by Saul Cole. And I have another Saul Cole guitar. And those are very special to me because I feel like these instruments, I don't have to worry about anything. I feel like they are very clearly connected to the way that I play and everything I want a guitar to do. And they have the ability to do things that I didn't know I wanted them to do. And ideally, when I have a connection with an instrument, on some level, I kind of just forget that it's there and I'm just doing the things that I'm doing. Oh, there happens to be a guitar there. Um, that's something I really go for and the, the coals are very big into that for me. But if I had to pick one guitar that was like really special, I would say that it's, again, going back to my dad, his um, sort of first nice guitar, he called it. It was a, it is a Gibson L4C, like a sort of smaller body arch top. I think it's um, late 50s. I don't remember the exact year, but I, I swiped that from him. Um, thankfully, my dad's still around and still playing, uh, but definitely I confiscated that instrument <laughs> from him <laughs> with his blessing, uh, I think, um, a number of years ago. And so it's funny because I'll never take that guitar out to play. I mean, there's so many things about it that kind of on paper don't really work for the way that I play a lot. Um, you know, it's a big hollow body. It's going to feed back. There's no whammy bar, which has become a part of my style. Um, but it just plays so great and has such a deep character to it. It's always by my desk, and it's really the guitar I, I play all the time at home. Um, you know, I, most of the songs I've written have been written on that. Um, a lot of things I've worked out have been on there. I have recorded, like, overdubby kind of things at home with it. Um, but that would be kind of the... If I had to pick one and a fire to get out of there, that would be the one I would grab. Yeah, sentimental yeah. value. It also sentimental does value. Things. Yeah, sentimental value that is also turned into like a, a real a guitar that's given me so much of my own. On top of that, yeah. Yeah. Well, you already mentioned your dad as being a guitar player and uh, you know part of the whole the beginning of this mess for you. Yeah. Uh, did you have any? Would, did he act like a mentor in the music world, or did you have other guitar mentors that helped you sort of figure out where? Yeah, you were I, I've, I've had so much help. <laughs> um, I feel like there's been a lot of people. Um, I can only, but I can only blame myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my dad for sure. Yeah, I mean, he showed me like basic stuff, and but beyond that, you know, my first gigs were with him on that that wedding band thing i think you know he would take me along once he saw i could kind of do some stuff and i would play with him and i remember we'd be playing songs and he'd be next to me and he'd go okay g and i'd play g and then c major and i'd get to c real fast trying not to mess it up and embarrass him and then uh, i did that a few times and then i think he was trying to maybe phase himself out of it so then he would just send me in his stead to do the gig and that was kind of cool i felt like oh man here i am like probably 15 or 16 playing with these older guys and not really messing it up too bad so that was a real cool feeling for me um, so he definitely gave me that first experience of feeling like I was able to hang with you know real pros that have been doing it for decades so that was a real real like positive push for me um, but just to I mean I feel like there's hundreds of people that have helped me so much to find kind of the important things in music but you know, real, just briefly, the guitarists, that, that's another part of the list, how many are not guitarists, but the guitarists that have helped me kind of realize what's possible through this instrument that I've felt lucky enough to have a lot of meaningful interactions with them um, would be a guitarist named Ted Dunbar. He uh, was one of the guys I first took actual lessons with, um, and that was when I went to college. Um, and if you don't know about Ted Dunbar's playing, such a heavy, deep improviser. He was in one of the earlier versions of Tony Williams' Lifetime Band. Um, I mean, among so many other things. But he really taught me about all the capabilities of the, the depth of knowledge required to play the instrument. Uh, and just about kind of the depth of what improvisation could, could be in general. So that was a big influence. Um, Definitely uh, getting to know David Torn uh, a little bit and 
considering him my friend and definitely my mentor. Uh, hopefully he won't cringe at, at me calling him that. Um, but especially in terms of kind of exploring the, the tremolo bar and the guitar, the vibrato system as a very important way to kind of get, a, get deeper into vocalizing with the instrument, getting a little bit closer to that human feel and all of the huge variety of things you can do with sound through the instrument and through effects and live processing. And again, just the depth of emotion possible in playing. Um, you know, Torn has definitely been a huge influence on me for that. And, and uh, so high up on the list also would be uh, Nels Klein, who's been really helpful in a number of ways to me and very encouraging, um, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on. Henry Kaiser definitely been hugely helpful and influential for many years before I met him, but also just very encouraging and, and very generous with his time and knowledge. Elliot Sharp, another guitarist that's been really helpful and encouraging with his expertise and time and knowledge. And, you know, I, I kind of hate going through the list because I know, oh, there's like 300 other yeah. people I should <laughs> mention. But just off the top of my, my head, I mean, those are the ones closest to my heart that definitely left a big influence on how I think about what I'm responsible for sometimes. Yeah. Responsible for <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, I keep it loose. I'm not putting a large weight on my shoulders, but you know, <laughs> I do think about it that way a little bit. Did you have a certain, you know, I can't turn back moment with guitar? I mean, everyone, you know, at some point in college, they pick up a guitar. They've got a neighbor, and they they sort of hold one. But then, did you have that point where you said, I, I got to go all the way with this? Yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty early. I think it was in high school. You know, like when I started to kind of realized that I was mostly playing guitar <laughs> in my time and you know I mean I wasn't like flunking out I always got pretty good gl grades and stuff but you know it's back to your question like thinking about definitely at that age I was thinking about the guitar a lot you know I remember like being in class and thinking about songs I was trying to learn on guitar and trying not to forget songs and stuff like that um, so I mean just really early on I kind of I don't think it was a big realization. I think once I was kind of playing a lot, I was like, oh yeah, I'll just keep doing this. <laughs> you know, maybe to the chagrin of my, my folks early on. But I, but I mean, yeah, I, I think I knew that I, it was just a thing I was gonna do. Um, but then, you know, I, I moved to kind of Northern New Jersey to go to school at, at Rutgers University and I mainly went there a, to study with Ted Dunbar, who was teaching there, but B, it was really close to New York City, and I grew up in western Massachusetts, which, you know, had its own cool scenes kind of stuff here and there, but um, I wanted to kind of be around some big-time energy in the music world, and so if you're from the Northeast, you just think like, oh, New York, right? So I wanted to kind of be around that, so I moved down there and, you know, got to meet a lot of people and had a lot of great experiences. Um, and I moved, well, I didn't move to New York. Well, I moved to, yeah, I did. I moved to New York for a minute after college. And then I moved to Jersey City, which is right across the river from Manhattan. And then September 11th went down and, you know, where I was in Jersey City, you could see the, the towers kind of just smoking and crumbling. And, you know, it was a pretty dark scene. <laughs> I mean, obviously, but you know, to make it, sound like a little thing but but the point being is that living in that neighborhood so close to that was really heavy at that time because there have been people who've lived there for their whole lives and I had just been there like six months and everybody was just very rightfully kind of feeling very freaked out and down and agitated and anxious and I just sort of felt like man this is a little too heavy for me at this point so I moved back to western Massachusetts at that point and in tandem with that, I kind of I kind of stopped playing the guitar a little bit. You know, actually, I stopped playing entirely for a while. Um, and that was kind of this moment where I, internally, I was thinking, okay, I know I love music, and I know I love playing, and I think this could be important for me. I mean, it feels important for me. But I had this idea 
which sounds totally like bizarre now when I look back on it, but my idea was like if I stop playing now and I don't feel like I need to start playing again, I'll just do something else and I'll save myself a lifetime of you know trials and tribulations of like trying to make it in in music and deal with you know you know poverty and all the stuff that goes along with being a musician I guess the stereotypes and so I and then I figured well if I do start playing again I'm only going to start playing if I feel like I have to play and then that will kind of make the choice for me so that's kind of exactly what happened and you know there wasn't like a strong control thing in, in this research I just sort of packed the guitar up and did whatever for a while I was delivering phone books and all these stupid jobs and stuff um, and I would come home and I would just sort of one day I just picked up the guitar and I was trying to I think I was trying to like just learn a Bob Dylan song or something and I had the record going and I was trying to figure out the chords and that was it and I pleased myself with being able to play along with this recording and then I went back about my business but this started happening more and more frequently where I'd come home because I was still listening to music at work or whatever and, and we'd get into it and would learn the song and it was only for the reason of learning the music because I wanted to just give myself that joy and I think that had something that was something that maybe had gotten a little lost for me like in the feeling of like oh I've got to practice this and I've got to learn all these songs and I've got to play like this way and I've got to do all this stuff and I kind of lost the thread of trying to be myself on the instrument and trying to give a personal feeling to my music which is the thing that I love and all the musicians that I love they all have a way to tell their own truth through their music and I felt like I had spent too much time trying to do things that I think other people thought I was supposed to do you know what I mean so in a way this kind of gave me back this true joy of like oh yeah you can just do whatever you want with music because that's what is the joyful thing and that's what will translate um so anyways this went on and on and i started playing more and i realized like oh yeah i did this thing and i'm back to playing so i guess i have to do this and then i actually moved back down to new york city and stayed there for about 15 years at that point hmm. so i mean you said that you quit playing for a while and it just kind of worked its way back in warmed its way this back is maybe in. about a year yeah yeah um and did, i mean since then uh, do you ever feel like you have a hard time balancing your regular you know your life outside of guitar with guitar or is yeah or i mean just feel like a healthy symbiotic <laughs> thing for you uh healthy <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not i'm constantly obsessed with my music and playing and making music but i've also gotten more relaxed about the idea that i don't have to do it every day at this point um there's a certain amount of ability i can rely on that i'm less stressed about having to do all my exercises every day i mean that that definitely falls by the wayside for <laughs> periods of time but um i don't i've gotten a lot better about not putting that pressure on myself like okay i've got to get all this stuff done today and i've got to get three hours on the instrument like i've definitely chilled out with that over the past several years so yeah i feel like it's it's cool you found a way yeah you found a way well i mean the way is that like if the music you try to make reflects your life you still have to live your life you know that's some gold right there <laughs> <laughs> it's a i think it's actually a paraphrase when i was in college a bunch of my friends and i went to that record that duo record of herbie hancock and wayne shorter had just come out it's called one plus one awesome record and they were playing at Princeton University and a bunch of us went down there to hear this concert and it was like super heavy and deep and amazing and one thing that was really strange was there was a bunch of people walking out in the middle of it like I can't imagine why people would split on that show <laughs> but whatever um, so we were there for the whole thing they probably played like I think they played like two and a half hours or something it was amazing and it was so heavy and then afterwards we were like in the lobby you know a bunch of like 19 20 year old mu music students going like oh my god we should try to meet these guys <laughs> so we f kind of thought we f knew like where the backstage was 
and it's got to be like five or six of us and there's like security there and i i remember specifically we talked our way into this having the security guard just let us roam around downstairs to try to find herbie and wayne after this show which seems bananas but that's what happened i think the guy at some point was like all right you're not going to do anything bad go ahead you know I, I don't know if he kept his job or what <laughs> but so we go down and we're lurking around and we see a bunch of doors and i remember we saw a door i don't know if they could have like a star on it but maybe it did or something and we knock and the door kind of opens and it's just wayne talking to herbie after the gig and they kind of look over like really surprised as they should have been <laughs> and they were like oh who are you so we tell them <laughs> and they go oh they just let you down and we we're like yeah and they were like oh that's crazy we we're like yeah that's crazy but <laughs> but since we're here <laughs> but, but we just we love your music and we just wanted to say thank you and we i think you know we were really gracious about it so i think they were cool as you know people people can be but i remember they were also really generous with their time because this is a really bizarre situation you just got a bunch of dudes who walked backstage after this really heavy concert and after you play a concert sometimes you don't want to sometimes you don't want to like talk to a bunch of people you want to just kind of sit there and go like oh man what just happened you know and kind of process it but here we are barging in on their their vibe and um but they were super cool and they talked to us for like 15 20 minutes they answered all our questions and everything and uh you know we were asking wayne like what should we listen to and he went into his whole thing about the scores of like old horror films and stuff and but anyways i remember this one thing about herbie kind of asking us what we do about music and we we're like oh yeah we just practice a lot and stuff he's like well don't forget that you got to live your life because otherwise what's your song going to be about g major <laughs> <laughs> and i remember we were like oh yeah that's right we got to remember that yeah let's write that down <laughs> so you know i and we didn't really go out of our way to try to live that in any particular way but definitely now i can look back on something like that and realize like yeah i mean that's really true like if you're trying to create a song that has some kind of input about a human emotion and you have a very shallow catalog of human feeling your songs may reflect that and that could be cool but that's never been the type of music that's been very attractive to me um so yeah to circuitously answer that question if i get a day where i'm busy doing other things and i don't get to the guitar it's okay because the thing i want to do with the guitar is express my life anyways so that's like the most profound answer. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, do you have any guitar regrets or scenes you wish you would have, you know, done differently? Well, not really, because I'm pretty happy with, with everything right now. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, there's no, nothing's perfect, but you know, like if you change, there's that butterfly effect. If you change something, what would have changed after that in the course of your life? So, yeah. I, I don't dwell on that stuff too much. This is kind of an out there question, and maybe I'm just sort of, I'm probing other people because I'm I'm curious if I'm alone. But do you lay like psychological and emotional stuff on the practice of playing guitar or doing music? Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if anyone can really answer that. Yeah, maybe it's just you. <laughs> no. Um, no, I don't think I'm trying to, uh, <laughs> Hold on, I, gotta cry. I think that question says a lot more about you, John. <laughs> no, I think, I think, uh, maybe, but, um, I don't think it could, I don't think it, I don't think something like that can bring a person's salvation anyways, you know, um, but I think it can sort of aid in the search for inner whatever, um, because, yeah, I mean, I don't think I lay it on the music, but I think I try to process it through music that's how I would maybe change the wording a little bit. Um, if I have some kind of crisis happening, yeah, I mean, definitely I know that the guitar is sort of there for me, or in the greater sense that this creative thing that I have always kind of done in some way is there. And that's, that is really the joy of sort of like 
um, evolving and manifesting a creative practice mm -hmm. over time is that there, there is a familiarity with the process. You know, I don't have a great fear that I'm never going to be able to write another song. I mean, I, in the moment, I have that fear, like, oh, man, I'm a fraud. I'm never going to be able to do this, <laughs> you know. Um, but deep down, I know that that's not the case because I've done it so many times and I know what the process is. And I hope that the process evolves and changes and continues to surprise me. But I do have a feeling always that that is, that is the thing that I can go to. And so I can process my stuff through the creative act. But I don't think, just to the way I'm interpreting your word, I don't think I lay it on that because I don't expect it to do anything for me without me putting everything I have into it in the first place. And so that kind of feeds, feeds each other anyways. I'll, I'll give you the copay for the, the session afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. That's an embarrassing moment, John. Um, it's helping me as much as it might be helping you. <laughs> Good, I hope. Uh, I'm kind of curious, you know, uh, and this is maybe another thing. When you're playing your best music, are you aware of what's going on? Or are you just sort of there and it's happening? Wait, let me rephrase that. When you're playing your best music, are you really present, or are you just blank and a conduit? I'm always there, and I know it's different for different people. Um, I know some people strive to to not be conscious of it, um, and I feel like maybe I've had some of those moments, but I think for the most part I'm there. Um, and I think that's cool because I do kind of notice it and enjoy it. And although there are times where I'm there and I'm playing and I kind of notice that it's going beyond me a little bit, just like a little split second kind of in front of me, these things are happening. But I'm not checked out about it. I, I am kind of like, whoa, this is really taking off. This is kind of interesting. Um, but those are only kind of fleeting. Um, but but they, those moments are there. But I do feel like I'm always there. But I. But even when I'm always there, I'm not always like all there. Does that, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. um, I maybe it's half and half. I like to be there because I like to experience that feeling. But sometimes that feeling kind of takes you beyond itself, anyways. Mm -hmm. I've found. That's the first time I've ever thought about the reason to want to be there. Oh, yeah. I always thought I was trying to escape this world by, like, checking out into some higher plane, and then, <laughs> and then you just tell me, like, yeah, but there's something cool happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to not be there for that. <laughs> like, oh, man, I went to this concert, and I wasn't even there. <laughs> man, well, I have a, That's I have, so healthy, and it sounds so simple. I have a theory about, like, just living life, which is, like... Um, which involves kind of being present, you know, like, um, and this was a weird thing because I had this thought when I was really little and I remember having this thought and I've talked about it to a few people later, just in passing. And they're like, Oh wow, that's kind of a weird thing to think about at like eight <laughs> or however old I was. But I remember like, and it was probably something just totally dumb. Like I got angry at my sister for, you know, taking the last french fry or <laughs> something stupid but i do remember like being upset about probably nothing and having this encounter with myself by myself in this emotion and the thought was like well at least you get to feel this and it just that was a thought that came into my mind and i kind of have dwelled on that at different periods of my life like yeah this is terrible or amazing but at least i get to f at least i get to feel it and there's something kind of interesting in that statement that kind it's sort of like you're pledging to sort of just be present for everything in your life because you you get to have that experience so like who am i to kind of decide that i don't want to have it through whatever means people try to check out of stuff um which is very warranted sometimes i think but just for me, I've always kind of had that little guiding 
a thing that pops into my head. So, hmm. so it applies to playing too. I wasn't expecting to have such an enlightening uh, response from you, but uh, well, dude, we're at the top of this mountain. I mean, what am I? True. What am I going to talk about? G major. Life <laughs> G major. Uh, you've been playing a long time. Yeah, I mean, like your life. You know, most a uh, huge chunk. Yeah, of I mean. Uh, my wife reminds me I'm 42 now. I thought I was 41, but I'm 42. Um, and I probably guess I started trying to play guitar when I was maybe 13. So whatever that is. Yeah, you've got some. You've got some time in, and I think you probably have a way of. I mean, I've listened to your music. You have a conception of music and playing and all that. And I'm wondering at this point, do you feel like? Let me phrase that. What do you think you could learn from the mindset of a novice player at this point? Oh, everything. That's my favorite thing to try to approach now. To try to just forget everything and think about playing as if I'd never touched the guitar before in my life. I, I, love, I love encountering people that do that. Or people that have played for longer or as long as I have or longer that still somehow can manifest that energy. Um, cause that's a thing that I have to be really careful about. Um, some of the most like biggest influence times of my life while I'm playing have been with people that play the instrument with so much more reckless abandon than, than I am at that moment. And it reminds me that that's a really fun thing about music is like, nobody's really going to get hurt if you go off the rails. And it can be so exciting. So I've been really trying the past several years, trying to make sure that I continue to kind of capture that feeling when I play every time, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think you can learn so much from somebody that's never done the thing that you do when you watch them try to do it. <laughs> All right. Remember when David Letterman would throw his cards over? <laughs> Uh, so some sort of accessible guitar stuff uh, I know that you have a Cole guitar with you here um, are you sort of a Cole player or I don't know whatever that or you just play you like those guitars and you play them I love Saul Cole as a person and um, I love the guitars he makes and I love the way that I don't have to worry about whether or not I could do something I want to do technically with the instrument like it's not going to fold <laughs> under high duress <laughs> situations right. um yeah but this is um the second one i have this is a, a tornado model uh, based on a kind of a collaboration between saul and david torn um but it's got a few little wrinkles of kind of things that i wanted to be involved in it for me and um yeah it's just what are the unique things that you, well, you, that know, you like, needed it to do? <laughs> well, one of the things that's kind of uh, in line with just part, you know, the way David Torn plays and the model is the full bridge cutout so that you can get kind of a large pull on the string. That's pretty much a fourth on the G string. Mm -hmm. So it's got a large range to that, which is really helpful, and it's very together with the intonation. There's, you know, I barely have to tune it. I mean, like, it's kind of a joke, but I barely have to tune the guitar. Like, I flew out here, and I was in the case for a day, and we drove up this mountain, and I took it out, and it's, like, totally in tune, <laughs> you know, um, which is insane, but that's kind of part of his, of his instrument. And, uh, you know, Torn has a whole suite of little effect, real-time sort of sound processing stuff on his guitar. But what mainly appeals to me is um, is playing less or reminding myself that more benefits come from playing less and being more of a listener. So one of the things that I kept was this um, momentary kind of silent switch, what people might call a kill switch. So if I'm playing too much or playing something that would, it will always benefit, the music I find will always benefit from me stopping playing <laughs> this is something i've come to realize over my lifetime so um so anyways it's been cool to sort of just have this right here which is in a good spot for me to reach it
So that's kind of just a little slight change of my own. Nothing original, but um, but the, my other coal has that as well in the same spot. Mm. Um, so they're kind of interchangeable. I think the other coal, the sunburst one that you can see in videos online and stuff and on some records, that one is a little more fiercer in its sort of pickup sound translation. It's got a little more like tooth gnash uh, to it than this one, I think, but they're but they're both um, great at what they do. So. So yeah, I mean, Saul's like just such an awesome luthier and just a great guy. The first time I met him, we actually just talked about the the art show at the, the Whitney Biennial that we were both had gone to that day in New York City. And we just talked about the exhibit for like 40 minutes. And I don't even think I asked him about, we don't even think we talked about guitars or something. We were like, we're at a gig. And I was like, oh yeah, did you see this piece by so-and-so? And I thought that was really cool. And then we met again and we talked more about sort of like art and design. And then we, we did talk about guitars a little bit. And he's just become, you know, kind of a cool sort of, of, of acquaintance. Um, but that also kind of really ties into a lot of the stuff that I like to use. Uh, it seems to be, and I figured this out recently, you know, like some people are really into like vintage stuff because it's got all this history and things, or people are into this and that. And I've come to realize like the mishmash of stuff I use really has to do with knowing the person behind it to some extent, or using stuff that's built by friends, or using stuff that's given to be my, my friends, or using stuff that was my dad's, or using stuff where I'm friends with the person that built it, or I'm friends with the people that make the work at the string company, or and it's really good for me because I have a lot of self-doubt when I play and when I write, and especially when I get on stage. I am 100% convinced that every time I go to play in front of an audience, that's the night that everyone's going to realize I'm a fraud and the jig is going to be up. And that's, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty much every time I play, I feel this way. It's, it's kind of a lot. But um, one thing that's been really helpful is just sort of having stuff that kind of maybe maybe acts like little totems for me like oh my friend made this guitar and my friend gave me these strings and my friend Steve makes these awesome amps and my friend gave me this cable and so I feel like I have this little support community around me but it's really just the stuff I'm using but I can picture all these people I know that have had a hand in it and the sound comes out great and it's like this big team effort that um, helps keep the illusion that I know what I'm doing going going on so yeah. long <laughs> I do think you're right when you, when you work with a, a builder or like a hand maker or something you know that what you have is imbued with some intention yeah oh yeah for you sure know, like yeah that, maybe that helps maybe well, that helps carry it forward the same way I want to really be thoughtful about some of the, most of the stuff I do when I make music I know that I know that that's the way people who are passionate about their craft are going to approach circuit design in their amps or the way the neck feels on the guitar or how the strings feel under your fingers or how the fuzz pedal responds in a variety of contexts so i i know from knowing those people to various extents that there's a trust that is implicit in the fact that i know that they care about what they do as much as what i care about what i do i want to ask you some questions boy we're getting a lot of traffic today uh, everyone we're, we're on a road Believe it or not. Yeah, you'll, you'll see the whole view momentarily, but uh, there's a road behind us. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about your approach to improvisation and writing. Um, I have no idea how long we've been doing this, but I think we have enough time to keep going. Yeah. You're good. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I looked on your website, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reading, well, first of all, usually jazz critics or music critics in general, they say a lot of stuff. I'm like, what does this mean, right? Yeah. And then I read something on yours. It was, first of all, I, I will say I, I was impressed. Everyone who made a quote about you took a lot of time and care to really say something accurate because I read all the quotes first, mm. you know, and as I'm listening through this whole archive of music and I thought, I don't know why these people care enough to really listen but they did so so it translated okay that's good to yeah yeah right, you, cool. yeah you should you i i think you were good in good hands with whoever okay. wrote all those quotes um but i think you're pretty hard to categorize as a player because you have 
back up. How do you categorize yourself as a player? I, I what, don't. Yeah, I mean, like, I'd said somewhere like post genre, and yeah. I thought, what the hell does post genre mean? That's my own that's, creation. That's you? <laughs> yeah. That's a, a phrase I'm trying very hard to coin. Yeah. Uh, post hyphen genre. Yeah. Well, Hashtag post genre. Yeah, it actually kind of goes back to the art thing, you know, where you can be like post surrealist or post whatever, you know. Um, but in, in the end of the day, it's 2021. And some of the greatest music in the world is being created by young people that do not have any of the historical hangups that older people have. And the music is like totally amazing and it mixes genres and it comes from all over the world. You know, like um, kind of like the Touareg music that's kind of finding its, its popularity in the West right now. You know, one of the albums I've listened to the most in the past few years is um, Kendrick Lamar's um, Good Kid, Mad City, I think it's the name of it. I might be messing up the name. But man, what an amazing work. It's this whole like operatic West Coast hip hop thing imbued with like all this emotion. You know, there's all this great stuff happening that the music and the artwork and the musicians and the people that listen to it, nobody cares about those labels. That's a truth to a large extent. There are people making music that care a lot about the labels, but again, for me, um, <laughs> my opinion, uh, so no one thinks I'm talking about everybody, my opinion is that like that kind of music, I know for myself, is usually not the stuff I'm attracted to. Like, if somebody's being like really very hardcore about making sure their music is called jazz, I would say there's a nine out of 10 chance I'm probably not gonna have a deep connection with the music. Hopefully I'm wrong all the time, you know, and, and that doesn't matter. But the way I think about it now is that that stuff is just so unimportant that it's kind of a drag to be pigeonholed when I try to combine a lot of different things. Because I listen to a lot of different things and I love a lot of different types of music and I do a lot of different things in my day-to-day -day life. And if I'm gonna reflect that in music, why would I wanna pigeonhole myself to being, you know, uh, early 20th century modern jazz guitar improviser like I feel like I'm more than that um, but I'm also not a straight-up country guitar player I'm also not a straight-up just sort of avant-garde improviser um, I'm not a straight-up rock guy but I have elements of all that stuff that I hold real close to my heart and I do try to not filter out in any way so so yeah the post genre term I think is as close as I can get to giving writers something easy to work with so it's my gift to the people that need to say something. <laughs> I, 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 re, I really, when I, like I said, when I first read it, I, thought, I, don't, I don't understand how to make sense of this. And the more I listen to your playing, because sonically nothing's off the table with you. Yeah. I mean, uh, anyone who works through your catalog and learns about your playing or already knows about your playing, there's things that sound like noise. There's things that sound like, you know, grungy fuzz pedals that are crushing your face. There's these beautiful, delicate, wiry, you know, there's a, like a solo, uh, I think it might have been a, an interpretation of a standard on your your most recent uh, duo album. In, in any case, nothing's off the table, but I was, well, I was wondering like, maybe I'm just part of that age group where we grew up with genres and s something about how you do it, it's almost like, uh, I can think of a language example. There's some people who speak two languages uh -huh. and they code switch seamlessly and they have their reasons for code switching. And it sounds like they're speaking maybe a third language, which is the combination of the two boy, these bugs are like all up in my face. <laughs> Desert fly. <laughs> Desert flies. Uh, but it, I mean, it almost sounds like you're code switching between genres, but, but you're not. Like, I think it's like you're thinking in like omni. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, and I think in an ideal situation, that's exactly what's happening. You're just, like like I said, like, music doesn't care, and if you're just making music, then what does it matter? Well, to your language example, I have a really great experience with that. My, um, my wife is from Nigeria, and so, of course, her family is Nigerian, and they go back and forth between speaking Yoruba and English a lot of times in the same sentence and so I'll go listening to them I'll hear the English and then they go to Yoruba and my ear kind of follows and then it gets disconnected and it's a very 
interesting experience for me because you know you know what someone's saying and then you continue to think you know what they're saying until you realize that you don't <laughs> you don't know what they're saying <laughs> but there's that effortlessness like among among them like kind of having that language experience where there's things i think i've actually never talked to them about it i probably should but there's a experience where i think there's probably some things they can describe better in Yoruban language and other things they can describe better in English language so they just sort of use it all together and it's a really cool thing to be around um, for me a lot of the time uh, so I think there is a, a good parallel there for sure yeah well, I think you know you've got some music that sounds delicate and beautiful and you've got which probably has some emotion there and then you've got some that sounds like you know face crushing yeah but don't it, it, but, but don't we all have that every day sometimes yeah, you but know like to your point if you were if you said i'm a jazz guitarist like half that stuff wouldn't be on the album because yeah. it doesn't meet the genre well people bring their own baggage with that so i don't want i don't want people to have to worry about what they think something's supposed to be yeah that's pretty brave by the way in a world that's been de de uh, you know designed and marketed and all that stuff like you 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 set yourself up to go out and say, yeah, like, I'm, what are you all about? Oh, it's hard to tell you. <laughs> well, it's a lot easier to do that since I believe in it than it is to try to fit some category that I don't believe in. You ever, like, tell a lie and then you realize you have to, like, continue doing that lie every time you see that person? <laughs> like, that's exhausting, you know, so I don't ever do that. <laughs> that is badass. Um, how do you evaluate your songs or compositions or whoever you're playing with? Like when it comes time, I mean, you do a lot of improvisation. When you do it, uh, what are you listening for to figure out what your contribution's going to be? I don't know if that's You mean in a, in a playing moment? Yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah, in a playing moment. You're playing with, you know, three other guys, two other guys, well, and you've got the whole yeah. palette of everything's available to you. What are you listening for to figure out, I'm gonna activate this kind of feeling or that kind of thing well I kind of have two ways of going about that um, again just sort of thinking about like a process I can rely on um, and the first actually the first thing that always happens is me going like oh my god what am I gonna do <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what I've come to realize is that I can either dive in and just start playing something and then in real time kind of evaluate how it needs to change with everything else that's going on to make sure that the music is upheld to like a high level of truth you know or I won't do anything and I just listen until I feel moved that there is something like legitimate and honest that I can add without destroying something that's already great without me um, and a lot of times it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that but those are kind of the the things that I'll fall back on I mean in a perfect world you don't think about it you get up there and the spirit moves you and you play the perfect thing but I mean, if you're going to just kind of call yourself a professional to some level, you can't rely on the hope that something is <laughs> is going to happen, you know. So, you, so those are kind of the things that I would think about knowing that I can do. But then you do have to kind of evaluate them and and what's your method for evaluating? I don't know, just kind of that's maybe an unnameable thing. I mean, do you think thing. in chord changes or rhythm figures? Oh, or, well, you know, yeah, do, sure. Yeah. Do you think about tonality? or? Oh, like, yeah, if you want to talk like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, if there's somebody doing rhythmic things, I can do do something with that or do something that fits that or do something that's anti that if I want to be antagonistic, if that would help the situation. Um, if it, <clears throat> Excuse me, if it is a harmonic thing, I am going to probably think about chords or I'll think about the set harmony so that I know what not to play if I want to be antagonistic about it. There's that yin and yang thing. If there's a tune with chord changes, you can play them or you can not play them, right? And that yields a completely different result. Um, but I just think of it as the yin to the yang of the tune, you know, probably to the chagrin of some people I've played with. But um, if you can have this thing, why can't you have the, the opposite of it, right? Because that's what it happens all the time. Like you have space and then you have like negative space. Like you have space and then you have like negative space in the space and it makes the shape kind of thing right so you i don't know can you have harmony if you don't have non-harmony <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean yes you can but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean i kind of just tend to think about it like that and i but how i evaluate the situation in general i don't that's something i feel is still unnameable like that's maybe ta you know maybe you can call it taste like why do i choose to do this 
instead of choosing to do something else. That I don't know. But I do kind of try to trust that that's there. So a lot of the music you make uh, and, and the improvising is it's it's sonic. It's not maybe tonal or, or harmonically thought out all the time. Maybe maybe I'm misstating that, but what I'm hearing, but I don't think it's accidental. Like there's a lot of times where people are, uh, you know, they, they sort of turn on their guitar and their amp real loud and start squealing and they like push on things and it happens. Like I hear things like tightly, tightly voiced intervals, like seconds that don't really just easily fall on the guitar sometimes. And you're using that. And I was wondering, Aside from just like turning it up and seeing what explosion sounds happen, what, how did you work through figuring out the different possibilities that were in a guitar? It's, well, you told me you had some mentorship on that, but how did what, what were you working with? Yeah, there's no original ideas for sure. I mean, whether it's like listening to Derek Bailey or Henry Kaiser or, you know, Brandon Ross or David Torn or, I mean, whatever, the list goes on and on and on, you know, old blues guys from previous lifetimes or Van Halen or you know I mean people have just done so many interesting things with the guitar and I think if I have anything to maybe add to some of that stuff you know it's the idea that I can hear something happen and then I can really kind of practice find a way to practice that so that it kind of goes into this area where it's something that's dependable in some way. I, I don't always want to predict exactly what's going to happen at all, but I want to know that I've worked on something enough that I can kind of know ways to manipulate it. Like a good, a good instance is like um, when, uh, you know, the Michael Jackson song, Beat It, yeah. which has the Eddie Van Halen solo in it, right? Yeah. And there's this, the beginning of the Van Halen solo is what is he doing? He's got the tremolo whacking against the body right which actually you can't do on this one because it goes it goes in without touching anything but i guess if you do it hard enough um but so that's kind of an interesting idea right just to take that little snippet that most people kind of go like whoa the guitar solo is starting and it's this amazing solo but that little moment is really interesting to me like why why go out of the way to sort of get that thing going you know because it's really cr a crazy sound and it kind of knocks people's expectations out you know and so to kind of understand that when you take that idea and you maybe work with that you start to hear like oh there's all these resonances that come out in the body you know and it's, it's related to the the tapping on the neck versus tapping on the body thing and if you're holding down different notes while you do that you get different resonances and if you're on a different pickup while you do that you can get different resonances to come out. And so something like that is maybe like an idea that you can get from a really famous thing. But maybe it's the part of that thing that nobody's investigated before. But you can take that little piece and just see how far you can take it. Um, and that to me has always kind of been a cool thing. Especially when, if I'm kind of like in that zone where I'm like, oh, I don't know what to work on right now. I, not to say that there's nothing to work on. I never say that, but like, oh, I don't know what I should work on right now. I'll just think about some aspect of the guitar I haven't explored. Like, you know, you, you know about the, the spots where you get like the real easy harmonics on the, on the instrument. But then you can kind of think about the spots, the little spots where they're, they're sort of lesser used, but you can definitely map them out tonally. So you know how to make an E7 chord with harmonics, you know, and you can map that on every string. So something like that was another thing for me too, really mapping out like full harmonic ranges on the fretboard, like into the little tiny spaces where you can see how the overtone series physically applies to the string and then how you can use that in a musical way. Um, and that's just another kind of interesting thing about playing the instrument or you know, like on this one, for sure, like a lot of times I can go behind. Those are all kind of B, I think. Yeah, more or less, you know. You can find ways to use that stuff harmonically, too, you know.
right? Ted Dunbar, my first like real guitar teacher, who I you know would go to in person for lessons weekly. He had this saying. He he would talk about the guitar neck, you know, like people oh people only play down here, but sometimes you don't play up here. You bought the whole guitar. Why not get your money's worth? <laughs> so the idea is been broadened a little bit by me you know like yeah I bought every piece of this thing so why don't I want to know what kind of sound happens when I get up here and how do you connect that to whatever you're doing um, so yeah I don't think there should be anything kind of off limits but but yeah taking ideas and just sort of seeing how far you can take something has been really um, kind of a cool thing for me do you do that in other aspects of your life like you buy a fish or something you're like I wonder if I can eat the tail too <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe not like with food so much, but definitely I feel like I'm very inquisitive about things. Um, some people might think I'm over inquisitive about this stuff, but I, I do always kind of want to know, well, why does it do that? Or why is this thing happening? Or how come it's doing this and not this? Or, you know, how do you get it to change? You know, yeah, I mean, I definitely, where it, div where it diverges is... I'm not always going to work on that stuff, but I do find that I am always kind of wondering about things, yeah. Do you know where that comes from, or is it just... Not really. I mean, I'm always surprised... Because not everyone does well, that. Well, I'm always surprised to find out that not everybody does that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, I guess I don't know. Mm -hmm. Gosh. What are we going to do? You know, like an, or an original thinker. It's just... <laughs> Let's lock him up. Uh, I want to talk about some of your current musical projects, because you have... Well, a handful in the not so distant future. I don't know how to talk about current musical projects in a time of COVID where the world was locked down for a couple of years because maybe there's a bunch of unfinished thoughts there, but time just kept going. Yeah. Uh, what are, uh, I know you have this duo with Chris Tyner. Mm hmm. Uh, and I know you, that, so I think that's your most recent release that I've uh, seen. I guess it is the most recent full length thing that's come out, yep. Uh, you also have, I know, a solo album that came out in 2019. Is that is that about right? Solo, as in like it, well, it was like your name. Oh like yeah, well, that would be the Wall of Flowers record, yeah. I think, and I, that's kind of a joint group. That's uh, the Mike Baguetta, Jim Keltner, Mike Watt moniker. Okay. Which is which is very different from my band band, which is called MSSV, which stands for Main Steam Stop Valve, which is me. Uh, awesome, awesome drummer named Stephen Hodges, and again Mike Watt on bass. Yeah, I mean you're in California right now. Uh, it sounds like you're touring with this duo a little bit. Yeah, we're finishing up the album release shows with the duo with Chris Tyner, which we call Tin Bag. Um, the album came out in the spring, as kind of was originally planned. And what you, people usually do is you put a record out and then you play some shows and you you know play the music and maybe sell some records and tell people about it so we never got to do that so this is sort of the late kind of album release tour and it's a great project to sort of dip our toes back into traveling for making music because it's just two people um for better or worse what do you think are the unique advantages and limitations of that well i think one of the cool things about it um is that it can kind of force you to rethink the role of the instrument, kind of the generalized perception of what's going to happen. Uh, I like messing around with that, like thinking about if people see, in this case, guitar and trumpet, or if they see like guitar and drums or voice or any kind of, any kind of grouping of instruments, I find, generally speaking, most people will have some kind of preconception from what they see. So I think what's really fun is trying to mess with that and trying to kind of, you know, because then you might be able to make people leave a show with an idea that maybe their perception can change about other things too. You know, I seem to kind of always get back into this grand idea of like what music could be or whatever, and I don't mean to necessarily, but I think something that's cool about that is people coming to something expecting one thing getting another and then leaving saying like wow that wasn't what i expected at all and in fact it was even better than i could have ever imagined but then i always wonder how much of the next step happens which is like do they apply that thinking to every other aspect of their life you know um which hopefully results in like more open-mindedness about everything I gotta say, I mean, a lot of what it just you as a person, it sounds like you're doing a lot of thought experiments all the time. With yeah, but I, I mean, I'm not like, 
it's not like I'm in my lab furiously cooking up some amazing conceptual, you know, I just sort of think like, okay, what would be cool to try now? <laughs> it's a good, healthy curiosity. I mean, there's a lot of fails along the way, too. I'll be the first to admit that, which I think is pretty important. Um, you know, if you try a lot of stuff, there's a lot of stuff that's not going to be cool or like that I would think is maybe not exactly what I was going for, but but that's why you do a lot of work, right? Like if you talk to any kind of great artist, I think they are constantly making stuff, but they're not sharing everything, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's guys in studios like just playing all day long and maybe at the end of the week they get like one or two really cool sounds they're going to use and something amazing, you know? And now, uh, MSSV, main steam stop valve. Like this is, you know, I listen to it top to bottom. That's, that's not helping with the bugs. Uh, <laughs> the shower was a strategic mistake. MSSV. Uh, these are like, this is another thing is how, how did you find this community of players? So for anyone who doesn't know, you, you don't live here in California. Nope. <laughs> you were you were a start on the East Coast and then you wound up in Knoxville? Mm -hmm. I don't know how that happened. Maybe that's a story too. And then, yeah. and now you've got this whole, like these are some- And now I live in Gainesville, Florida. So how did you get hooked up with all these California guys? Like some of them are, you know, like, well, they've all played with really eclectic people and some of them are punk rock legends. And how did this grouping come together? How, how do you, how are you networked all these? Well, people? yeah, it's kind of a long story, but the short version is I first met Chris Tyner, the trumpet player in the Tin Bag Duo, when we were both in college, and he's from out here, and I think he was going to Cal Arts, and I was going to Rutgers, and we met at this thing in Washington, D.C. for, like, young musicians or whatever. And, uh, you know, long story short, he ended up putting some gigs together out here, and this has got to be maybe... I mean, I want to say it's like 1999, or maybe it's like 2000, 2001 or something. I came out here for the first time and, you know, he knew a lot of people and he had a lot of great musician friends and I just met them and these, they're like, it was easy to make friends with them for whatever reason and they just became really good friends of mine and we stayed in touch and I would come out with Chris and we'd play and then I started kind of setting up my own stuff while I was out here just so I could stay out here longer and get to play with some of these other people. And, um, you know, you're sort of, group of friends just kind of gets bigger sometimes um, and so I was living in New York for a long time too New York City and I had a bunch of friends out there from other friends I'd made in Boston another place I'd never lived but I have a lot of friends that were kind of in Boston for a while so I do have this benefit of like a lot of people don't really know where I live <laughs> which I think is kind of cool like and actually I don't correct people a lot of times I just kind of let them think what they want to think but yeah I've never lived out here I've never lived in Boston um, but uh, yeah so anyways the MSSV band came together because of a friend who I'd also met peripherally through Chris Tyner his name is Chris Schlarb and he's an amazing amazing musician songwriter engineer producer studio savant uh, artist and he uh, he lives in Long Beach and he runs Big Ego Studios and Big Ego record label and he runs a great band outfit do you still call a band an outfit <laughs> he runs a great musical outfit <laughs> called uh, Psychic Temple um, which I've gotten to play with a little bit and who I've also made a lot of other friends through through Chris Schlarb um, and so anyways uh, Chris Schlarb and I had met and become fast friends and he was starting a record label and he asked me if I'd want to record something for the label and I said yeah but I want it to be something really different from anything I've done before um, which at that time kind of meant in a way kind of meant maybe trying this thing of just sort of calling some musicians I had never met to try to make some music together and I had never done that I'd always made records up to that point with friends, you know, like you get, you make friends and you play music and you're like, oh, this is fun. You start a band, you do some shows and you're friends and then you're like, oh, we should make a record. That's how I'd always done it. But I was having, and that was always the way it was very comfortable for me to do. It was very frightening to think about like calling someone you don't know. And also it kind of seemed a little bit like a, like a shill kind of thing in a way, like in my more sort of like jaded side, like, oh, why are you just going to call some 
dudes you don't know to make a record like how real is that and I always had like a chip on my shoulder about that to some extent um, but it's not always it's not always a thing to like flex on to do that I don't think and so what opened my eyes to that was actually talking to David Torn one day and he was telling me that his first record Cloud About Mercury which is like a touchstone record for me like what an amazing album I just sort of assumed he was buddies with all those guys on that record and he told me that he had never met any of them before that project and he cold called them all you know and said hey I have all this music and I think you might sound really good on on this would you be willing to try it and he's got all these stories about making that record that are really interesting um, but so in any any event the takeaway for me in that moment was like oh my god this is like one of the greatest records of all time that sounds like these guys have known each other for decades and have had all these great friend experiences with but they were just getting to know each other on that album so I thought okay so maybe there is a way to do this and yield like more honest results than the worst of what could happen with it so it just kind of opened my mind to that so fast forward and I'm talking to Schlarb and so he says well what do you want to do and I and in my mind I just had this crazy idea which it was crazy to me that no one had done this before but I said well I want to play trio with uh, Mike Watt and Jim Keltner playing together mainly I want to hear them play together <laughs> because I'm surprised that no one realized what a great rhythm connection the two of them would have and it seems sort of a tragedy that no one had tried to um, pull those strings so so that was my idea and then you know Schlarb and I we laughed and laughed and <laughs> realized like oh this will never happen but man what a great idea and so we kind of kept joking about it for a year or so and then eventually we joked about it enough that we were like oh we should actually really try to do this this could be cool um, and throw so you know Chris Schlarb was like highly instrumental in making this happen and connecting everybody and finding a day we could all get together and I had some music written and I had some expectations and I tried not to hold on to those expectations because what am I going to tell those guys what to play like those guys could like tune their instrument and it would sound better than anything I'm going to write you know so I tried not to I tried to make sure I wasn't going to be like in a control freak kind of mindset whatever happened was going to be great you know which ended up being true and we improvised a bunch together and we had a couple of things that I written that we, that we played and um, yeah I mean I was right those guys sound awesome together you know and uh, and what I was also right about was the fact that you know you can trust the musicians that you're playing with to the extent that even if you think like oh man there's no way I have enough music to make a, an album length thing out of if you just make music with great musicians that know what goes into making great music you shouldn't be surprised that you're gonna come out with great music that's been made you know and for me I just considered myself a fly on the wall kinda of hanging on to this <laughs> freight train of like awesomeness you know um, and so anyways I took home some of the free improv stuff and cut it up and recomposed and transcribed and overdubbed and turned them into songs which is which is definitely another thing that I've stolen from David Torn um, but tried to kinda of do it my own way hopefully and so that was the Wallflowers record and it came out and I wanted to do some shows and so I asked Watt if he would want to do some gigs and he said of course which was really generous of him and then I asked Jim and you know he he doesn't really travel much anymore and that's very fair <laughs> he said you know many many decades of playing with everybody in music playing so great with everybody in music but so yeah that was no problem and so but then I went back to Watt and I was like well I don't know is it weird to get someone else to try to play some of this music and he said no you should just think about who you want to do I mean I'm down to do it and maybe it'll be something maybe it'll turn into something else and I hadn't really thought about that I was like oh yeah okay we'll see so I thought well if I have to pick another drummer to sort of think about this I might as well stay with this idea of like people I don't know and so the next person I thought of was Stephen Hodges on drums and it was never a thing it was never really a thing where I thought of him as he was going to sub for for Jim Keltner it was this thing of like well we have a chance to do something more and to move this music into another zone and that'll be really interesting so I 
talked to Stephen, and I thought of Stephen because I loved his drumming on so much, so much music. Um, you know, from Mavis Staples' group to the early Tom Waits records he's on to the soundtrack work he's done with David Lynch and on and on and on. He's like just such an awesome musician. But he is the drummer on Watts' first opera called Contemplating the Engine Room. And that album had a really profound impact in my life before I met any of them or ever dreamed I would meet any of these guys. And also our friend Nels Klein plays guitar on there. And that's the trio. It's Nels and Watt and, and Hodges. And so from that, what I knew was that Stephen and Watt had some relationship. But what I really knew was that Stephen would be really comfortable with this idea of not worrying about the genre of things. Because that album, Contemplating the Engine Room, that's an album that also kind of opened my eyes to that idea. Like, here you have a band of only three people, and they have made a cohesive sound and a cohesive statement on an album through the music that Watt put together. But they are not restricted by any kind of genre, style, thing. I mean, they traverse the entire territory of music on that record. And it was kind of, and I had started thinking about this stuff when I first heard the record in like 2000, 2001 or whatever. And I remember hearing it going like, oh my God, they did it. <laughs> you know, so, and then I was like, I'm not crazy, see? <laughs> um, so in my mind, I was like, well, man, if Hodges would do it, that would be awesome. And luckily he said yes, and we did a 10-day coast-to-coast U.S. tour in early 2019, 10 cities in 10 days, flights and everything. And halfway through, at one point we were like, so what are we going to call this band for the next tour? Actually, Watt asked me, so like, what are we going to call this band for the next tour? And I was like, and I realized at that moment, I was like, oh yeah, okay, we should do that. <laughs> and luckily everybody was into it, and um, we did another tour at the end of 2019, which was a little, another little mini tour, I should say, that was just, was it maybe six or seven shows, only in California, trying out new music, and then we went right into the studio for two days and recorded it, and that's the studio album, Main Steam Stop Valve. Uh, and then we booked a U.S. tour, about 50 dates, for spring of 2020, and obviously that got postponed. Right. And I have just recently rebooked <laughs> uh, almost 50 shows uh, for our U.S. tour this spring, March and April 2022. Yeah, it looks like a massive massive set of shows. Yeah, it should be fun. Yeah. If someone wants to find out more about you or any of these bands, what's the best place for them to go looking? And Yeah, th I mean, the internet is great for that. Yeah, I've heard of this thing. <laughs> Google. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's websites too, which I think is really important. Like some people only have everything on Spotify and Facebook or whatever, but, um, but you know, if you have the website, you kind of own the whole thing. So anyways, there's mainsteamstopvalve.com. It's a website for that band. You can always go to mikebaguetta.com also, which is sort of the general home for my universe of things. And you can link over to MSSV through there. Um, there's also tinbag.net. Uh, if you want to see what's going on with that group and all the records and all the music is available on Bandcamp that's a really cool platform that we use I like Bandcamp and I think yeah. artists make more money there than they do in any, most of the other places where it's just really painless to use which I think is the highest priority for me um, and then if we're playing shows we've always got stuff at the shows um, there's a lot of stuff happening coming up soon with MSSV so it would be cool to if people want to keep track of that, we have a bunch of seven inches that we've recorded. One of them came out on an Italian label. That's available now, and we'll have that on tour. And there's two other seven inches coming out in the next couple of months. Um, and the uh, MSS, the Mainstream Stop Valve record, is almost sold out. So we're getting a repressing done for that in time for tour, also. So it's a lot going on. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your time. Yeah. No. Thanks uh, for having me. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if you want to play some guitar or something for a minute, I got to pack up all these things and tell all the people driving around to stop driving into the shop. Okay. And uh, thank you. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. <laughs>